We have to invest a great deal more in the tools of translational medicine, an area which sort of falls in the middle and gets less support than the basic science at one end or the large clinical trials of the drug companies at others. So the right balance of resources across the domains of uh, basic research, translational medicine, and clinical trials has yet to be achieved. So we need to expand this open source model, which Mr. Kennedy's already been referring to. So the first major recommendation of what can we do better is get more open sharing of all relevant clinical data on the characterization of disease state and drug response. Obviously, you need to protect individual privacy. And the second big push would be to put the research tools and compounds held by both commercial entities and universities and private and, 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 and funded investigators into the public <laughs> domain, into what we call pre-competitive space, and get that out there as quickly as possible. And to make that possible, we probably do need innovative approaches to the intellectual property issues which currently impede this sharing of technology and data. So um, actually, I'll stop there, but I can go into much greater detail of how this might your, be done. Your, your entire statement will be in a record, Dr. Potter. Okay. But, but I would like to mention one thing, that we do have an initiative, which uh, Dr. Kilzor referred to, the foundation of the National Institutes of Health, where we are beginning to try to bring us all together to work in this pre-competitive manner. But I want to emphasize that the funding and infrastructure and degree of support to really do it at a proper uh, national scale is, is simply not great enough. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Coetzee. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Kennedy for inviting us to speak here. I'm honored to be here with these distinguished panelists. My name is T uh, Timothy Kutsi. I'm the president of Fast Forward, uh, the venture philanthropy arm of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. We've made a commitment to ensure that potential new therapies actually make it into the clinic and are developed and are able to be used for people with all forms of MS. Um, we have found that all too often promising drug treatments languish, languish because companies lack the funding, focus uh, to conduct pivotal research that will break through barriers and move a compound through the development pipeline and ultimately into clinical trials. Um, we fill the gap that's often called the valley of death by creating a collaborative environment between scientists, clinicians, academic researchers, and of course commercial visionaries. Um, by creating these vital networks, um, fast forward increases the focus on MS and speeds the process of bringing drugs to market. Um, today, we join with our patient advocacy colleagues in calling for more investments in, um, in, and policies to sustain innovation in neuroscience research and development. In our view, expanding and sustaining innovation in neuroscience R&D really requires three cr critical elements. As you've heard today, we need to sustain a large and vibrant medical research community in the United States. Um, medical innovation doesn't happen in isolation. It happens amongst a community of scientists and physicians actively involved in understanding knowledge and disease about biology and human disease. Um, it is vital that we continue to expand our commitment to the National Institutes of Health and work also funded through the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration. Second, we also believe that we have to create an environment conducive to the formation of what we call fluid networks of scientists engaged in translational research. We know that research and innovation happens faster when scientists work together across networks, fields, institutions, and borders for that matter. Um, coordination by the government agencies, private foundations, and patient advocates is critical to ensuring these networks. And lastly, we believe that government, foundations, and patient advocates have to use their influence and financial resources to connect people together across sectors. We know from our own experience that uh, p young companies and innovators work smarter and faster when you have experts in the private sector working with experts in the academic sector. We need to do more of this so that all of the stakeholders can enhance um, neuroscience R&D. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, the United States has a long history of being a leader and driver of neuroscience research and development. Unfortunately, we do find ourselves in an environment where economic challenges are beginning to threaten this leadership. Um, as patient advocates, we urge action to ensure that there's greater coordination among the stakeholders. Every day, Americans receive the diagnosis that they have a neurological disease. Um, these individuals do not have the luxury of time. They need our help to create a research and development environment where they can have access to the best treatments to stop their disease and restore lost function. Thank you for helping us move closer to that world, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Dr. Parker. 
Uh, Chairman Kucinich, uh, Congressman Kennedy, thanks a lot for inviting me here. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story of TBI uh, through a rather, I guess, uncommon lens because I'm a soldier and a scientist. And uh, I'm going to start last year, last March, in the Tangy Valley in Afghanistan. You'll see up there, we were on a patrol and a lead vehicle. We'd been fighting since about off and on, since about 8 o'clock that morning. We hit an IED, it flipped over the MRAP, and there you see uh, us running up to check the soldiers. About 30 seconds after this photograph was taken, an RPG hit that cliff right above our heads when we were trying to pull the wounded soldiers out of the back of there. Um, and then the day got a lot worse. Um, but that just kind of illustrates the situation. We're talking about combat stress, um, and there's a lot to that, and we can talk more about that later. But this kind of illustrates what's happening out there in the battlefield. This is the ignition event for TBI and it's the ignition event for those neurodegenerative diseases that can result on down the road. So if you'll move to the next slide, please. So I want to just teach you a little bit about TBI, and I can only teach you a little bit because I'm not a neuroscientist. I was doing the heart um, when someone started trying to kill my friends with IEDs, and I figured I better get a piece of this fight. So if you take a look, you imagine that the, the whole patient, the soldier, the behavior, um, those functional uh, disorders that can uh, arise from neurodegenerative diseases, that's a meter length scale. What happens when that ID, IED goes off? Well, the brain listed up there at the top of that scaling law gets slammed forward into the skull because that shock wave couples into the body. And it starts a cascade of injuries that goes from the centimeter scale of this brain through the neural networks that allow you to recognize a friend, speak to a loved one, count your change at the Burger King. It disrupts the neurons, breaks the synapses, all the way down to the nanometer scale at the bottom where you see integrin binding to extracellular matrix. This is where mechanical forces get transduced into physiological signals called mechanical transduction pathways. In this case, it's a pathophysiological signal because we're activating signal pathways that we don't necessarily want to activate. Slide. This is the, the temporal scale uh, of, of TBI, and I'm going to look mostly to, on this timeline to the right of the blast, what we call right of boom. Um, so you can assume that prior to the blast, um, we assume we get stable neural structures, stable vascular structures, uh, stable gene expression. Now, that's a, there's a big asterisk next to that, right? Because these guys are in combat. They're facing physical danger, moral jeopardy. There's a lot of stress hormones there. We don't know exactly how they might be impacting all those structures. Once that boom happens, things start happening on the nanometer scale. Proteins undergo conformational changes that turn on those signaling pathways that cause excitotoxicity, that cause these neurons to have their membranes torn, to activate signaling pathways in mild uh, cases of TBI that you might not see for some time. You can't diagnose them currently. And if you follow that timeline going all the way across to the right, spanning out through the rest of the epidemiological lifespan of that soldier, you're going to see a variety of problems emerge. They might not emerge right away, but eventually they might. And when they might, when they do emerge, every time they emerge, if it's 20, 30 years on down the road, that's one more victory for the opponents that we're facing on the battlefield. When they take another soldier down with Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or dementia on down the road, they're still winning that fight. We talk about counterinsurgency as a long war. Taking care of these casualties is the longer war. And what we need to do is develop a cohesive plan to address this longer war. It's interagency, just like we've got on the battlefield right now. Uh, but interagency, like you heard from the first panel, is the only way we're going to solve this problem. So I want to make a couple of recommendations before I close here. Uh, when you start taking a look at putting people onto this problem, uh, I think there's, as an outsider coming in, there's a need to evangelize the scientific community about TBI. We talk about job retraining for people that have been in textiles, that have been in the automotive industry, that need a new job. We need retraining for scientists who want to come into this field, who are trying to make that jump. That's very difficult for them. So this might be as simple as running courses at the Marine Biological Lab at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, or Cold Spring Harbor Labs in New York. It could be as simple as that. It could be something more complex, where NINDS, VA, DOD, and NIMH get together. Um, and, and start talking about that kind of job retraining. Because that's literally what it is. Uh, the, we need funding mechanisms for long, sustained interdisciplinary efforts. Earlier you heard about the prosthetics program that's being run out of DARPA. The program manager for that is Jeffrey Ling, who's the only neural intensive care doc in the Army. He's also the program manager for my DARPA funding. Uh, the TBI program called PREVENT, Preventing Explosive Violent Neurological Trauma. You got one guy doing this thing all by himself over there at DARPA. But these kind of interdisciplinary fights where you need people that understand shock physics, cell and tissue mechanics, molecular biology, neurobiology, psychiatry, that's very complex. 
And you probably won't find an instance in American or scientific history where all those scientists have been represented in the same room at one time. About the only people that can pull that together is DARPA. But DARPA does short-term funding. They come in, they impact a field, and they move on and let another agency pick it up. We need a longer-term, more sustained effort at bringing these people together for a long time. Now, I think that two things need to happen in terms of establishing goals for this field. One is, I'm not going to surrender that turf that you see just to the right of boom. Right now, if you get a mild TBI on the battlefield, we're gonna, you might get treated, you might get evaluated, you might get pushed back into the fight. And one of those soldiers that was in that photograph I showed you earlier has been blown up 10 times between tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's going to happen when suddenly he goes home one day and he can't remember his son's name? That's a victory for the enemy. I'm not going to surrender that turf to the enemy. If you take a look just to the right of boom, when I run up there and I take care of that soldier, when I pull open that MRAP door to see if he's okay, the treatment for that TBI needs to start right then. So one of the goals that we need to have for this interdisciplinary research program is to develop a technique or a means of treating prophylactically the neurodegenerative diseases that might not emerge to 20, 30 years on down the road. The second thing we need, and this was something that was mentioned previously, is we need a Framingham Heart Study on TBI. It might be PTSD too. But the DOD and the VA keep great medical records. I'm from, I live in Massachusetts. The Framingham Heart Study run by Boston University has revealed all kinds of great things about heart disease that scientists like me who traditionally work in the cardiac field, now I split my time between TBI and, and the heart, have used to guide our scientific studies. We currently don't have that database. We need that database. A Framingham Heart Study and then short-term goals. So over the entire time frame uh, of, of the disease, and that's what TBI is, it's a disease. We need opportunities, we need funding, we need organization, and we need leadership to do that. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to testify. We need your leadership. <laughs> thank you. Kevin, awesome. Thank you for your service, every which way. Yes, Dr. Morrison. Yes, I'd also like to thank the chairman and uh, Mr. Kennedy for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the potential and promise of neuroscience. I'm here today on behalf of the Society for Neuroscience, which is a nonprofit membership organization of more than 40,000 basic scientists and clinicians from around the world who study the brain and central nervous system. Our members work across the entire research spectrum to advance basic understanding of brain function and to translate basic science discoveries into treatment strategies for more than 1,000 brain illnesses. Exciting achievements in scientific discovery have fueled tremendous progress over the last decades positioning the neuroscience community for transformational progress thanks to new tools and technologies that enable us to study the brain as never before. And you've heard about some of those today. Today, I'd just like to offer two brief examples of emerging discoveries that hold promise for research in the American people. First, neuroscientists are making great strides in understanding the brain circuits involved in PTSD and how, the, how these circuits are altered by stress. We know now of a number of altered brain chemicals and uh, systems associated with PTSD, and the part of the brain that links learning and memory to emotion is smaller in people with PTSD. As Mr. Kennedy pointed out earlier, PTSD is circuit-based. Mm -hmm. Specific circuits are malfunctioning. Neuroscientists are also making tremendous progress in understanding the neurobiology of aging. We know that a part of brain cells called spines in the prefrontal cortex are, are depleted as we age, and this leads to cognitive decline. These basic research findings have already provided scientists and clinicians with new therapeutic targets to prevent the loss of spines and retain cognitive health. And these same observations will help form a new approach to therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. The importance of neuroscience research is reflected, in, and you've heard about this already today, in the fact that brain and nervous system disorders result in more hospitalizations than any other group um, affecting more than 50 million Americans a year at costs exceeding $460 billion. A strong investment in basic science innovation is also critical to our national economy. It creates thousands of high-wage jobs at a critical time. Biomedical research must be seen as one primary solution for diseases and disorders that already cost society hundreds of billions of dollars a year, several of which increasingly threaten our social fabric including my area of expertise, Alzheimer's disease. Two years ago, the Bipartisan Alzheimer's Study Group, co-chaired by Newt Gingrich and Bob Carey, painted a very troubling picture of the social impact of Alzheimer's disease if we don't do more to delay or prevent progression of the disease. 
The outlook for Alzheimer's is not morally sustainable for those millions who we know will suffer terribly or for their families, nor is it economically sustainable for our nation. The situation is repeated for a thousand other brain disorders. At a time of economic challenge for our nation, the economic question is not how can we afford to invest in research, rather it is how can we afford not to invest in research that has the potential to save many times the dollars invested. The issues discussed today remind us that scientists and medical practitioners must be much more engaged in a two-way dialogue if we are ensure that discoveries translate into treatments and clinical observations are integrated into research development. We've seen this referred to several times today. Neuroscience research that benefits one condition or disorder has broad potential applications for many conditions, making it critical that we encourage more collaboration that crosses traditional scientific boundaries. One of the most critical collaborations is across what has traditionally been thought of as two largely independent enterprises, basic science and clinical research. In fact, we must recognize that both endeavors are necessary components of a continuum that leads to translation. We must encourage and facilitate scientists and clinicians to work together as a team to translate scientific knowledge and discoveries into specific personalized approaches to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. One example of the importance of practical scientific application and translation is our increased understanding of synaptic plasticity, which is in essence the brain's ability to modify neural circuits to better cope with new circumstances. This incredible capacity for adaptation is a fundamental property of the synapse, and our understanding of it emerged from basic science, yet it is already having a revolutionary impact on therapeutic strategies for multiple brain disorders. In closing, we live on the forefront of an era of breathtaking potential to advance biological knowledge and human health. Our future success will depend in large measure on sustaining the, the strong investment in basic neuroscience discovery, as well as team-oriented collaborative approaches between the basic researcher and the clinical researcher. I look forward to the road ahead in this exciting field and what our success stories will mean to the American people. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, we have we have another series of votes. Mr. Kennedy and I have conferred, and we're each going to uh, take uh, three minutes for questions or comments, and then we're going to adjourn this. <coughs> but I would just say that there will be follow-up questions that myself and others will submit to you, um, and we'd ask that uh, you, for your thoughtful consideration on uh, what questions members of the committee submit. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, you're recognized for three minutes, and then I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we are speaking uh, today, a Rhode Islander in the Fort Hood committed suicide as we were conducting this hearing. Uh, he's from Middletown, Rhode Island, in my district. Um, he committed suicide and murdered his wife. He is, um, leaves behind two children, one six and one is two. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Parker, Kit Parker, who is uh, could very well have served alongside of this Rhode Islander in his service as a Rhode Island guard, um, pointed out most poignantly these are combat deaths. And they're part of the enemy strategy. And whether they're killed in action or they're killed over here because of their wounds of that action that they saw, it's a death as a result of this war. And if we don't take it as such, we're not going to approach it as such because we'll think of it as something else other than part of our war effort. So the urgency that you gave us, Kip, in terms of fighting this fight as if it were fighting the enemy, because this is the enemy's fight that they are taking to us. We got to take it back to them. And that kind of uh, call to action that you gave us, so poignant, so powerful, and I think s serves to act as a catalyst for all the things that Dr. Po Potter was saying about the need for a national priority to be put on this that's going to return the science in short order on the emergency level that it's demanded because we're not turning it around fast enough. So for everybody here who acted, Tim as well, that open source need for sharing of science because we're all in it together and the need for us to do it fast and furious it, for the benefit of the people who will, who will come to benefit from this and to bring it to a national scale is so welcome. And I thank you all um, for their, that. And that, that image, Tim, of a valley of death 
the value of death and translational research, from moving that research in, in uh, the lab to the bedside to benefit people. That's a valley of death. That's the, con that's the word you use. It is a valley of death. Every day longer we leave these veterans in that valley, we're shirking our responsibility to go and set them free. Thank you for your comments. And Dr. Potter, if you could keep uh, submitting for us the kinds of regulatory science reform you think would be necessary at the FDA to give Dr. Hamburg her support, along with what we asked uh, the NIH and other uh, directors to talk about, so that when, we, when they come up with something, we can move it right into practice. And if you could just close by commenting a little bit about where that is just such a lacking part of our FDA. No offense to them, they need the support from us. We're gonna, what we'll do is ask if you respond in a letter on that. Perfect. Uh, and I, if I may, I'm, I'm gonna try to make sure that we can get to vote here. Um, I, I wanna uh, thank Pat Kennedy again for um, being instrumental in creating this hearing. Um, Dr. Morrison, uh, can uh, high levels of stress impair synaptic uh, plasticity? Absolutely. Okay. Well, let me qualify that. Absolutely in animal, in animal models. There's no question they about can. it. They okay. can, um, okay. Dr. Keel, you talked, you said something that I thought was, you know, everything you said and all the witnesses have been very important, but you said, our brains are modeled by the social environment. That parallels uh, the studies of David Bohm, the quantum physicist, who said that the world is a hologram of the brain, which is a hologram of a world, mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was really looking at the uh, holonomic theories of Carl Prebaum, and they basically got, and they got together and, and you know, addressed the issue of the brain in a more global way, which is what your testimony uh, I, I assume is is um, is advocating when you talk about the choreography of the brain, uh, you're speaking of the brain in a more in a, in a much broader sense. Instead of things that are site specific, you're looking at at the brain in terms of uh, its uh, vast vastness. Is that? Yes, I think the idea is that things are integrated both in space and in time in the brain, and that's how new functions emerge that we cannot comprehend by looking too molecularly. And that the brain is the place where nature and nurture meet, and so the social environment is just as important as the genes that we are born with. Well, you know, the, the, work, the work then of, let's say, a um, uh, Maslow becomes relevant. Right. Uh, the work of um, Carl Rogers becomes relevant. Exactly, yeah. Um, I, I'd just like to conclude in, by saying uh, one other thing, and that is that we, we've spent time talking about soldiers, and Dr. Parker, thank you for uh, bringing this uh, very specific study of the impact of, of war and the physical impact of war, and then the long-term impact of war. Um, we also need to look at post-9-11 America when you talk about the social environment, the brain being modeled by social environment, mm -hmm. we've got an America that's been filled with fear mm -hmm. and, um, and violence, whether it's vicarious through the media. And that has to have an effect. Yes. It just does. Yes. Uh, that's gonna, I'd like that to be a subject of uh, perhaps uh, another hearing in which maybe we can ask some of you to come. Uh, we have uh, two minutes uh, to vote. Uh, Representative Kennedy, I just uh, thank you for your dedication. Uh, this, as chair, I can promise you that our subcommittee is going to stay in touch with each and every one of you. I think the work that you're doing is important to uh, the future of the world. Thank you. Hearings adjourned. Good job, good job. Good job. Oh, no, 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 you did great. I think the messages were remarkably aligned. <laughs> That's great.